Have you ever wondered that sometimes we pray wrongly? As James says, to spend it on your passions, James 4, verse 3. We want what we want, not what God wants. Some time ago, I came across a wedding prayer that illustrated how subtly this can be done. This is a girl praying on her wedding day. Dear God, I can hardly believe that this is my wedding day. I know I haven't been able to spend much time with you lately, with all the rush of getting ready for today, and I'm sorry. I guess, too, that I feel a little guilty when I try to pray about all this, since Harry still isn't a Christian. But, oh, Father, I love him so much. What else can I do? I just couldn't give him up. Well, you must save him some way, somehow. You know how much I've prayed for him and the way we've discussed the gospel together. I've tried not to appear too religious, I know, but that's because I didn't want to scare him off. Yet he isn't antagonistic, and I can't understand why he hasn't responded. Oh, if he were only a Christian. Dear Father, bless our marriage. I don't want to disobey you, but I do love him, and I want to be his wife. So please be with us, and please do not spoil my wedding day. Well, that sounds a sincere prayer, doesn't it? But if you strip it of its pious, flat-fine language, it's really saying something like this. Dear Father, I don't want to disobey you, but I must have my own way at all costs. For I love what you do not love, and I want what you do not want. So please be a good God and deny yourself and move off your throne and let me take over. If you don't like this, then I ask is that you bite your tongue and say or do nothing that will spoil my plans, but let me enjoy myself. Have you ever tried to move God off his throne and put yourself there instead? Have you ever tried to disregard everything that God has said about himself and his commands because we thought that we knew better? You know, every time we sin, that is exactly what we're doing. We're telling God that he doesn't know what is right and what is good, and we know better. And so we're going to do our own thing. But throughout the book of Jonah, we have seen Jonah doing exactly the same thing. In Jonah chapter 1, we saw Jonah trying to run away from God. In chapter 2, we saw Jonah running back into God. In chapter 3, we saw Jonah somewhat grudgingly obey God. We saw that he didn't give the Ninevites all the information about God that he could have. But Jonah was running with God, but not wholeheartedly. Throughout the book, we've seen Jonah try to run God. Jonah has been thinking throughout the book that he, like the bride-to-be in the prayer, knows better than God. And he knows what should happen to the Ninevites. And so Jonah has been trying to put himself on God's throne. In the last chapter of the book, we hope that Jonah finally learns his lesson. We hope that Jonah finally repents and finally agrees that God can be gracious to the people of Nineveh and that he does not deserve grace any more or less than they do or we do. Remember from last week, we had three unanswered questions that we asked from the text. As we come today to the end of the story of Jonah in chapter 4, we want to come at it with these three questions in mind. As Jonah was told to preach fire and brimstone to Nineveh, he knew, as we do, that generally in the Old Testament, when God sends someone to preach judgment upon a nation, that nation is destroyed. But Jonah, instead of quickly doing what God asked, fled in the other direction, 
So we asked our first question. Why did Jonah not want to go and preach fire and brimstone in Nineveh? Also in chapter 1, it seemed to us that Jonah would rather die than obey God. And so our second question was, why would Jonah rather die than obey God? And finally, in chapter 3, we saw that while God did love and care for the people of Nineveh, that, that that was not his primary concern in the book of Jonah. It appears that God was after something else, and we suspected that it had something to do with Jonah himself. So our third and final question is, what is God trying to teach Jonah? All three of these questions get answered in the last chapter of this book. The fact that they are answered indicates that they were appropriate questions and that the author intended us to be asking them all along. Now, before we go to the text for answers, I'm going to quickly review the different theories on the different and uh, upon what different scholars think the purpose of Jonah is. Now, this will help us with our question number three. We agreed that God had a plan to accomplish, but we have not seen what that plan is. Today, we're going to see what God's plan is and what is the purpose of Jonah. By the way, if you preach to a city and every person in that city responded and repented of their sin, how would you respond? Probably, most likely not the way Jonah does. But that depends on the city. So let's look at how Jonah responded when Nineveh repented. Jonah 4, verse 1. But this was very displeasing, displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. Why did Jonah respond in this way? Remember Israel and Assyria were rivals in a contest that would only leave one nation surviving. Sounds familiar. Jonah was a prop popular prophet in Israel. And if it appeared to others that he was helping the enemy, his career would be over. Also, the Ninevites were quite wicked and cruel. And so Jonah probably hated them or at least hated what they did. And so he was hoping that God would destroy them. Now we should not be too hard on Jonah here. We also sometimes wonder why God doesn't judge a certain person or group of people. In World War II, people were wondering why God didn't just destroy Hitler. Today, we question Putin. Maybe sometimes you wish your boss would get into an accident or a really annoying colleague would get fired. Maybe you have a neighbor who, if the house burnt down, might say, well, he had it coming. But let's look at the honest prayer of Jonah in verses 2 to 3. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to, <coughs> <coughs> to die than to live. <coughs> Here at last, we have answers to two of the three questions. And finally, an honest prayer from Jonah. We see why Jonah would rather flee to Tarshish than preach fire and brimstone to Nineveh. And why he would rather die than obey God. <clears throat> the answer to both is that he knew God was gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Jonah is quoting from Exodus, chapter 34. Jonah knew his Bible, 
I knew that God was gracious. He did not want God to show compassion on Nineveh. He didn't want the heathen nation of Assyria to receive blessing and forgiveness from God. In fact, it seems that Jonah disagrees with how God handled the situation. Jonah is trying to tell God how to behave. God's love and grace is wonderful when it is directed towards Jonah and toward Israel. But God showing love and kindness towards Israel's enemies, they don't deserve it. But Jonah knows God's character. And is telling God that he was wrong to give grace to the Ninevites. Jonah, in his anger, is attacking God's actions, saying that the people of Nineveh do not deserve God's grace. What Jonah forgets, or does not know, is that no one deserves God's grace. Maybe sometimes we expect things from God, thinking we deserve it. If so, we are forgetting Romans 3, verses 10 to 12. It says, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. And it would appear that Jonah thinks that grace is earned and that God is obligated to give grace to those who earn it. Jonah has come to expect grace from God because, after all, Jonah is one of the chosen. But Jonah seems not to realize that God is being more than gracious to him as well. God could and maybe squash Joseph like a worm. Sorry, Jonah like a worm. But God wants to teach Jonah a lesson. Jonah knew that there was a power struggle between Israel and Assyria. That if God ended up destroying Nineveh, that would be the end for Israel. And indeed it was. The nationalistic patriarch Jonah was the instrument God used to help Israel's enemies who later destroyed Jonah's homeland. This is exactly what happened about 40 years later. An Assyrian king by the name of tiglath the III began the conquest of Israel and by the end of two years had destroyed Israel and deported the people. It may be possible that Jonah was still alive, knowing that he had played a part in the collapse and defeat of Israel. But all of this is beside the point. Jonah doesn't exactly know what will happen if Nineveh is not destroyed, although he can probably guess. But he hates the Ninevites so much that he wants God to destroy them anyway. In fact, now that God has been compassionate on Nineveh, Jonah would rather die. He's probably seen as a traitor in Israel, and God was now blessing the people that he saw as the scum of the earth. So Jonah was angry with God, so angry, he says, that it would be better for him to die. Let's look at Jonah, verse 4 to 8. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush, so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. The 
This is a question I sometimes, I'm sure that God sometimes asks us when we think we know our way is better than God's. God is asking Jonah the same question we would ask of him. It's as if God is saying, Jonah, I had every right to kill you for disobeying me. In fact, I had more right to destroy you than I did the Ninevites because you knew about my righteous requirements and chose to disobey anyway. They did not know. And although they were living in sin, they were ignorant of my requirements. Now that they know, they have repented of their sins. And so I have turned from my wrath. You have still not repented of your sin, and I am still being gracious and patient with you. Have you any right to be angry? Well, Jonah, in typical Jonah fashion, does not answer God, and instead goes to sulk outside the city. Apparently, he hoped that maybe God would destroy the city after all. And perhaps he wanted to watch it as it happened. He may have been waiting to die as well. But while he was waiting, God was still at work with his goal. <clears throat> Verse 9, we see the second question of God. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? God asked this question again. He first asked in Jonah 4.4, 4, and Jonah did not answer God. God is still trying to get through to Jonah. Jonah didn't answer God in 4.4, 4, but here he does. Because the question is no longer about the city, but about the vine. And he said, is it right for me to be angry even to death? Well, with all this talk of death, if Jonah was alive today, he would have been considered suicidal. He would have been put on suicidal watch even. And why does he want to die now? Because his plant has died? Jonah is furious about a plant? He liked the vine and wanted to enjoy its shade. And here God had killed the plant, so Jonah was angry. He was so angry with God that he wanted to die. Let me ask you a question. When do Christians get angry with God? Whenever we think we deserve something from God, and we find him guilty of not giving it to us? Whenever we think someone else is unworthy and we are angry with God for giving them blessings they don't deserve? Whenever God takes away some blessing from us for which we think he had no right to remove our pet, our health, our money, our job, our loved one, our dreams, our plans, how about whenever we are self-righteous? <clears throat> All these things were true of Jonah here, and he was angry with God. So now, since God finally got a response out of Jonah, God is going to teach Jonah a lesson. Verses 10 to 11. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and for which you you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? <clears throat> and with that, the story ends. That's the end of chapter 4. Strange ending. Why is the vine there? Why does the story end this way? 
It seems as though the story should have ended after chapter 3, when God had mercy on Nineveh. But that wasn't the end. Why not? Because the story is not about Nineveh. You see, it is about God and his dwellings with a man whose heart is cold. Jonah wanted the city to be destroyed. He did not care for anyone in the city. But he cared for a plant. And God is saying, Jonah, look at what you're saying. You did not cause the plant to grow, and yet you loved it and wanted it to survive. Neither did you cause Nineveh to grow. And yet you wanted it to be destroyed. And Nineveh is full of 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left. In other words, they are ignorant about me and about my requirements. They do not know good from evil. Yet if you had to choose between 120,000 people and a plant, you would pick the plant. The book closes with one final question from God. Shall I not be concerned with that great city? In typical Jonah style, he does not answer. We don't know what his response was. We do not know if God got through to Jonah's heart. We do not know if Jonah repented of his ways. We don't even know if Jonah learnt his lesson. Why does the text not tell us? I believe that because the text is primarily not about Jonah. Most people think this, is, this story is about God's love for other nations. It isn't just that. Or well, the story would have ended in chapter 3. A few people think that it's the story of God is working his mind and heart out through a prophet of Israel. The story is not really about that either. Because we are not told how Jonah responds. So what is the story about? The story is about you and me. The text leaves us hanging because it asks the question, what about you? What would you do if you were in Jonah's space, place? What does God see in your heart? What do you hate? What do you love? What are your priorities? Do you love your car, sports, or money-making more than you love your family? Are you more concerned with how you look? Or do you care about your, the welfare of your neighbors? Are you more concerned with your personal security or comfort than helping others who might be overseas? or who might need to hear the gospel. Here is the question the text asks of you and me. What are you concerned about? What is God concerned about? And do they match? If not, you need to have a look, and I need to have a look at my heart. Because God's concerns do not change. But he is on a mission Change your heart. He's not so much concerned with where you are or what you do, but in who you are. The question is not, where can God use me the most, but where can God change me the most? God's will will not necessarily be a place but a heart or of a character. Who do you hate? What does God want of you regarding them? Jonah was patriotic and knew that if he prophesied to Nineveh and then God had mercy on them, it would seem like he helped Nineveh. And he did not want to help his enemies. It would seem to all Israel that he had betrayed them. 
their God had betrayed them. But God was not out to uphold his own reputation. And he was not out to uphold Jonah's reputation. God was after a man's heart. The real reason for the book of Jonah is not letting Gentiles know his mercy, as most he as most teach. Jonah is about God's mission to the heart of a man. And this is often the most difficult mission to undertake. The text leaves us hanging as to whether the mission was successful or not. The reason? What about you? What is your heart condition? Sometimes God asks us to do things, not necessarily because he wants them to be done, because at first he wants, first and foremost, he wants to work on our heart and teach us something about his love and character. Look into your heart today. Examine your motivations and fears. Examine your willingness or unwillingness to obey God. Is God after your heart? Do you harbor resentment and hard feelings towards a specific person or group of people? This is the lesson of the book. It is the same lesson Jesus taught in Matthew 5, verse 44. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. There is a story of Dr. Howard Hendricks of Dallas Theological Seminary. He tells that he and students picked 10 people who they couldn't stand, who were mean to them, and decided to pray for them. Over the course of a few years, all 10 became Christians. That is the proper way to love those we'd rather hate. That is how Jonah should have responded. And that is how we should respond as well.